Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy day before Friday. Happy Thursday uh, to you and yours. Uh, awesome, awesome show uh, planned for you today. Uh, TJ Moe is still uh, seated to my right. I believe that's my right. Yeah, that's my right. Uh, TJ Moe still here in studio with us uh, in Nashville. Great to have you back, TJ. Uh, we're going to talk today exclusively, TJ and I, with uh, Royce White, who I believe is uh, become, he's moving up the most wanted list, the Democrat, the left wing uh, establishment, or as, as uh, Royce likes to say, the neoliberal movement. He's moving up on their most wanted list. Uh, he's now perhaps public enemy number one. The Washington Post, Thursday morning, this morning, published a long, three to 4,000 word uh, hit piece on Royce, uh, calling Royce, let's make sure I get this properly, how a former NBA player and activist became a far right media darling. Mm. Royce White, our very own fearless soldier, uh, has transitioned from NBA player and activist to a darling of the right, far right media uh, they accuse him of associating with Steve Bannon. Uh, that makes you a far-right uh, media darling if you associate with Steve Bannon. Uh, he's associated with Alex Jones and Tim Pool. Uh, the Tim Pool thing really blew my mind. Uh, I, I, I mean, I know Tim Pool. Uh, to label him some far-right whatever, but any of it, it's all stupid and silly, and so, Today, we, we kind of just like scrapped the show when we saw this article and said, I just got to talk to Royce White and how he feels about being public enemy number one uh, because he's running for office, running against Ilhan Omar in Minneapolis. But I think beyond the threat of him unseating Ilhan Omar, which they clearly must take uh, seriously, I, I, I think people are hearing Royce and have heard what I have said about Royce. Royce keeps saying things on this show and on other shows, and I think the last time I had Royce on, or last week at some point, I was like, dude, I think you could be president. And, <laughs> and it sounded crazy when I said it, but I actually meant it and believe it, and I read this Washington Post story, and we'll bring Royce in now, I read this Washington Post story and I was like, hey, uh, Royce, I think they believe it. I, th <laughs> I think the left thinks like, Royce White can, could potentially be president, uh, we better shoot him down now, and uh, I, I, I get why you're wearing your uh, public enemy uh, bulletproof vest, Royce. Uh, you're, you're a target <laughs> of the neoliberal establishment. Well, absolutely. And uh, thanks for having me back on. It's, it's, it's been a kind of hectic morning, but but giving me a lot of thought. And, you know, this is a wild time we're in the, the law of uncertain outcomes. I wanted to read some today for the audience to start us off. Then I got a few comments and, and we can go where you want to go from there. This was William J. Casey, 1981 director of the CIA. He said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. That was the director of the CIA. Now, for the Washington Post to call me a white supremacist, a uh, white nationalist, really what they want to say is you're crazy. So they should just come out and say it. Right. They want to call me the N word, but they know that'd be a little far from their platform and make no mistake about it. The Washington Post is a neoliberal Marxist globalist institution. Go ahead. You look like you want to say something. <laughs> I think you're accurate. I have had my dealings with the Washington Post. Uh, and, and have had them frame me inappropriately, and I've attacked them for that in writing, and, and basically, 
more politely said exactly what you're saying. Is that I like, you're the racist, and I think the guy's name was Ben Strauss that's written about me and has, mis, has you know, misframed me on several occasions, but the Washington Post is a racist institution, and if you, as a black person, don't support the script that they're promoting, they will assassinate your character the way they're attempting to assassinate yours. I mean, Royce, I, I just wanna walk through the piece because there's so many fascinating elements all the way to ending with an alleged family member of yours allegedly a attacking you. So they threw everything but the kitchen sink at, yeah. you, <laughs> at you, Royce. And so I get what you're doing in terms of laying the foundation with the CIA director and uh, calling out uh, the Washington Post for its blatant racism. But as again, as you said, an interesting morning for you, when you read this piece, did you know it was coming? Had, did they call you and ask for comment? What was your reaction in reading the piece? And then what feedback have you heard? And just, did you know this was coming? Yeah, we knew it was coming. I mean, I, I, I agreed to do the interview. I must have done three hours of interview um, with, with, with David Gardner to, to complete this piece. And I gave him the contact information of a few people as well, such as A.J. Barker, Jeff Quatnitz, who's partners with Ice Cube and the Big Three and, and some others as well. Um, so I was completely, uh, you know, I, I, I was completely um, open to participate in getting this story right. And I cautioned this journalist uh, to how the editors may change his words or change my words. And I said to him at that point, if anything in this story seems defamatory or, or uh, misinformation, I will ask that the complete transcript of my three hours of interview be released to the public. Uh, and, and I will not hesitate to take legal action against The Washington Post. Uh, so, um, but, but let me circle back if I can, Jason, please uh, allow me to retort. Hold for one second before you, I, I want to ask one follow up to that. I read the story and I kept looking for quotes that I said that gave me the indication that they interviewed Royce. I read the story and felt like all the quotes came from things you said on other platforms. Well, there were very few quotes for me altogether. But to be honest, the quotes in there for me, I'm completely OK with. And and the things that were said about me, for the most part, I'm OK with. There were a couple blatant errors in there. Number one, my mom was never a waitress. She was an esthetician. And, and they, that shows you how bad they are at this journalist thing is because that's very easy to find out. Not only have I said it publicly, but anybody they talk to knows that my single mother being an esthetician is something I, I talk about often. So it, it's an easy thing to figure out. Um, there were some other things as well, and them trying to, you know, mental health shame me for being an advocate, because uh, that's a part of my story as well, and saying that I was hospitalized, or my grandfather saying that I had to be hospitalized for anxiety, which isn't true. I've gone to the ER for panic attacks sometimes, which I think people should do, because the the symptoms mimic heart attacks. But again, let, let me circle back, please. Hold for, i got to hold for one more second, because you said something fascinating to me that may... You're not a journalist, and so it, it, it may not trouble you as much as it troubles me as a journalist. Okay. If they did a three-hour interview with you, this story should not rely almost totally on things you said on other platforms. So that, that's what it seemed like, and you correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I misread the story, maybe I read it too quickly, but were there quotes from your actual three hour interview with David Gardner in this piece? Because my memory says everything, came, oh, you said this on Steve Bannon's show. You wrote this in a piece earlier. You, was your, is anything you said in that interview in the article? Um, one quote, if anything, that I remember. Everything else was either from my Substack or stuff that I said on Fearless, or something I said on on Bannon's uh, War Room show, um, or or maybe something I said on Infowars also with, with Alex Jones or Tim Pool or you know all these other platforms. You're right. There was a quote from MSNBC when you were on with Joy Reid. There was a quote from, but it, yeah, what? So th to me, that's irresponsible, dishonest, and 
uh, just were, were they in the room with you when you went on Steve Bannon's show? Because that opening scene comes across as if they were there when you went on the war room with Steve Bannon. No, absolutely not. Gotcha. So now go ahead and circle back and make your point. Thank you. Okay. I've said this before many times on the show, and I'm going to reiterate it right now. We are in a crisis of leadership worldwide. And due to that crisis of leadership, we have a crisis of information. If we had competent, willing, uh, moral, courageous leaders, the crisis of information wouldn't be as bad as it, as it is today. And I'm going to use my story and something we talked about early in the week to help lay this out. If you believe that the reason I'm not playing in the NBA today is because I'm afraid to fly or because of my anxiety, you have a problem with how you get your information. If you believe or if you allow the NBA to get off of the hook by justifying their blackball of me, their blackballing of me, because I wasn't worth the hassle of the things I was discussing, I wasn't skilled enough, you don't know anything about the game. You don't know anything about the game of basketball, the game of politics, or the game of life. The consensus around the NBA circles, team personnel, front office people, coaches, current players, former players, is that my not being in the league now or any time has never been about my talent or skill. Okay, now I say that because there is a significant group of people or audience, even of our audience, that wants to say, keep the sports separate from politics. And my point again here today is, sports are politics and the politics are never off. And this piece shows you that. And I wanna circle back because I got a lot of feedback about the Reggie Miller comment. When I was talking about Reggie Miller, I wasn't saying that he's a sellout because of his take on Ben Simmons. I agree with that take on Ben Simmons, as a matter of fact. I, like I said, would be playing if it was me, okay? In, in fact, I never missed a game at Iowa State. I missed one game at Iowa State because I had the flu and I actually tried to play in that game and two minutes in I threw up and I couldn't stop throwing up and I was pissed I couldn't go back in that game. Okay, so I play when the time comes. Ben Simmons should be playing. I don't know what's going on with him because I'm not personally connected to him and I understand that there are things that could really be going on with him from a psychological standpoint. I don't know that to be true. I wouldn't handle mine the way he has. The reason the, what I said about Reggie Miller ties into what we're dealing with around the world. Reggie Miller being a sellout is a categorical fact. And he, like many other public figures that have been propped up by this neoliberal establishment, have ceded the territory for Satan to, to mislead the American public and the public abroad. When I say he's a sellout, what I mean is, if you take money to talk about the world that you see, and it comes with the unspoken agreement or expectation that you don't talk about certain issues or that you don't talk about certain issues with any conviction, you're a sellout, full stop. The NBA is a shill for the CCP. The CCP is in on it with the globalists and they want everybody's freedom from here to Beijing. Anybody who won't speak to that with any conviction is a sellout. And you know who the best example is of this? You know who the validation of this, this argument is, Jason? You. Go ahead. <laughs> you are. The reason why people you... love watching Fearless, the, the reason why people love watching this show is because you defected from the mainstream establishment to talk about the issues that nobody else would touch. That's why people love you. That's why I watch you. That's why when people say Jason Whitlock had something to say, I go read it or listen to it. When people say Reggie Miller, Stephen A. Smith, uh, 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 the, the list goes on, we can name them nine out of 10, I go, oh, he's a sellout. Not because of their, 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 their position on that individual issue, but because in the general sense, I know that they have given the concession to speak about the most important issues of our time for the pay, for, for the paycheck.
from the establishment that means to undermine our citizenship and freedom. So yes, Reggie Miller is a sellout, and it's because of people like Reggie Miller that the Washington Post feels empowered enough in their liberal ideology and, ideology and indoctrination to call me a white nationalist. You've made an excellent point that I, you know, I, I do want to be crystal clear. Reggie Miller's jersey hangs in my apartment. He's one of the greatest Pacers of all time. Loved him as a basketball player. So this isn't a, and again, if people understand what you're saying, you're not really taking a vicious attack on Reggie Miller. You're basically saying the overwhelming majority of people involved in corporate media, ex taking those big checks, they have agreed, and, they, and many of them know there are some that don't know. They're not smart enough to know, they're not well-read enough to know, they're just former athletes, they're just happy to be on TV, but you're a thousand percent right, there is a deal that has been cut. I'll even simplify, you don't even have to be smart enough to know that uh, uh, the CCP is in bed with the NBA, you don't need to know about Marxism, you don't need to know about any of that stuff, but Take, other than Charles Barkley, and I think occasionally Shaq, occasionally Shaq, you don't have any athletes, professional athletes, willing to go on air and say, hey, we may be exaggerating a little bit about our fear of the police. You know, I've been a professional athlete for a long time. The police have provided me protection when I go out to clubs, private security, all kinds. Of, they're not even honest about their own relationship with law enforcement. And they, they're not honest because like, there's a script they have to follow and we all have to pretend like, oh my God, if I go out, I could be treated like Ahmaud Arbery or George Floyd. But they know that's not true. And so you're right, there is a level of uh, cognitive dissonance, I think they call it, uh, or the, just avoidance of the truth. Again, and what drives me crazy, and we can move, remove from sports and all that, it, it's many black people that have experienced the climb up the economic ladder and movement into uh, middle class or upper class are reluctant to then turn back around and tell and explain to other black youth, kids, people, here's how I did it, here's the steps you need to take in order to succeed. Instead, they're turning around and saying to people that uh, you can't make it, America is so racist that you can't make it, that's the message and that is a sellout move. Back to you, it Royce. There's a crisis of selling out. I mean, and, and what makes me most concerned is that as sports fans, we seem to not understand that there's a crisis of selling out. We create this little small sphere of, of acceptance or pacification for people who we admire regarding their accomplishments uh, in sports. And look, Reggie Miller was a great player, one of their all-time best. LeBron James is top three players of all time. I think Mike and Kobe still have him, but as far as I'm concerned, he's right up there at the top. We have to be able to separate our idolization of individuals and their, their professional accomplishments from their morality and ethics. And if we can't do that, we are highly susceptible to what William J. Casey said about the CIA and their disinformation program. Because they don't even have to really lie to you, do they? All they have to do is give you somebody who can be successful enough to get your adulation and have them pedal or steer clear of all the issues that they need to talk about. And it becomes that simple. So. No, go, Royce, I want to read you a quote uh, from someone who says they're a former coach of yours. Uh, that was in this Washington Post article. It's all effed up, said one former coach who spoke on the condition of anonymity because he hoped to salvage uh, his relationship with White. Quote, I think, I hope he's doing it because no one on the left 
is going to give him the platform that he's getting on the right. He's smart enough to realize the power of this platform, even though deep down inside he knows that the people he's associating with are despicable. They've said things about his race, or they've said things about his race are despicable. He's not an idiot. Your response to that? Yeah, whoever speaks under anonymity is a coward. That's the bottom line. These people are sellouts. And it doesn't matter if you were my former coach or not. Look, the first, the first marching orders of individuals who want to be truthful and defend humanity and freedom and our citizenship are going to have to do it within people who they've had lifelong relationships with. And so whoever this coach, now, there, it may be that this coach didn't even say that because we know that journalists do things like that, right? And they may be misrepresenting this person's words. I don't know who this person is. Um, they know they couldn't say nothing like that to me, obviously, which is why they spoke under anonymity. And that says something about what they feel about my level of conviction around the things that I'm saying. So he's actually giving me a compliment while he's trying to throw me a diss. And I, and I like that. Um, he, he, here's what I'll say to go back to this article in the, in the broadest sense. The biggest thing I had a problem with is that they said I led protests about police brutality. And that's why I wore the vest here today, because it's the same vest I'm wearing in the picture. And in the picture, we're outside the Federal Reserve. They know that the protest I led was about corporatocracy, which they are in on 150 percent. And they still want to try and make it seem like police brutality was the central focus of my of the protests I led. Why? Because they want to they want to disenfranchise me to the base who they say that I'm just pandering to when really I'm trying to clarify these things for the Republican Party as well, because there is a uniparty. There is a two party uniparty in our country. And William Casey, he was a Republican who was hired or, or came into power underneath the Reagan faction. And Reagan is adored in the Republican Party. And I think Reagan was a decent president. But I'm not playing favorites. I'm equal opportunity when it comes to calling out corruption. And they hate that because they're in on it on one side. Clearly, my protest that, that the, the protests we led in Minneapolis were a response to the proliferation of what was Antifa and maybe intelligence community driven anarchy. And I did it in the belly of the beast and I brought the Ministry of Truth and I talked about the corporatocracy and I talked about the hypocrisy. But even on the Republican side, let, let me talk about the Republican side for a minute here, because a lot of them want to say, and you've seen it. I know you've seen it. All of us have seen it in the comments. Yeah, we like Royce and what he had to say, but he supported Black Lives Matter and he led those George Floyd protests. That's why they put a picture of, of me writing George Floyd on the side of my head at the big three. They want to dis they want to disconnect me from the growing nationalist populist movement by saying that I'm a BLM, uh, uh, you know, I'm a BLM supporter. I never supported BLM. I went to, I did what many Republicans have forgotten to do, ha have, have lost a sense of ministry, ministry. The liberal movement, the neoliberal movement has pushed conservatives out of the metropolitan areas and the conservatives believed that if they ran to the suburbs, liberalism wouldn't follow them. And the reason why we've lost this country is because Republicans have not made it a priority to go back into the inner cities and clean up the narrative that they are not racist. Some of that may be because there is some racism left in the Republican Party. Some of it may be because they just are afraid of the liberal movement or, or being called racist. All of those things are a possibility. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not afraid to go into the heart of the north side of Minneapolis where crime is the worst and say you've been lied to. That's why they're afraid of me, because they know I'm not afraid, like some of my other Republican counterparts, to go into these places that have been abandoned by the genuine conservative nationalist American platform and movement and candidates. That's why they're attacking me. And you know what's, what? You know what else? That's why the NBA wanted me out, because they knew. And clarify the NBA, why would they fear that they fear you as a symbol that may 
again, may lead the players the direction they're uncomfortable with? No, 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 no. They fear the truth. They fear anybody who will speak the truth unadulterated with no pretense. All of the people who are speak, who speak out in the NBA, they're only willing to go a certain, a certain, to a certain level. And Enos, re- remember now, I talked about the Uyghurs in 2019. Enos just started talking about China this year. They were afraid that a young player like me, who was not going to be bought and paid off, was going to have an infectious quality on other athletes who had the potential to rise up with their platform and be genuine leaders against their globalist establishment movement. And in that, you can throw in the commentators around the game, like a Reggie Miller, Stephen A., or anybody else. They're all in on it in my eyes. And I'm calling all of them to action. Stand up. Tell the truth. They're afraid of the truth. The NBA, the Washington Post, okay, the the, the mainstream media, the media industrial complex, they are afraid of people who will not take a paycheck as as a quid pro quo to stay silent on the most important issues of our time. That's why I started talking off, that's why I started off talking about the CIA. People don't even wanna acknowledge the implications of the intelligence community in our modern times. The the argument that the anonymous coach is making is that Steve Bannon and the inference, the way the story is framed, oh boy, if you just knew what Steve Bannon has said about black people, we're not gonna tell you in this article, we're just gonna let this quote hang out there and then we'll connect him to Steve Bannon and you, boy, boy if we told you what Steve, but this despicable thing Steve Bannon has said about black people, how dare Royce White uh, connect himself uh, to Steve Bannon. One, I know you've done it previously, but I want you to do it again. Explain your relationship with Steve Bannon, uh, why you like, I've had him on this show, I, I like him, but I'm not some, I don't know Steve Bannon, his whole body of work. Uh, I just know how he's dealt with me and the things that I've seen don't trouble me. At, at all, but he's one of these despicable people you're allegedly associating with, and, and therefore we must dismiss Royce White, uh, and, and I, I find it hysterical because I kind of agree with Steve, and that's the realization I came to last week, was like, this dude Royce White is really dangerous, that, uh, <laughs> you know, he has so much reach potential that he's really dangerous since Steve Bannon called you the second worst thing to happen to the establishment since Trump. But anyway, explain your relationship with Steve Bannon and why they're inaccurate here. And I want to say, excuse me if I'm if I'm a little amped up today, but I don't like no, being called. Stay amped up. I don't like being called a white nationalist by white liberals. And, and I'll say this. Steve Bannon. Has asked a very simple question. Where has the neoliberal uniparty globalist politics and policies gotten black people, the working class, but also specifically working class blacks and Hispanics? That message resonates with me. It resonated when I heard it, when I actually looked at the history and the trajectory of how this country's policies positioned black and brown people economically. I understood what he was saying. And before I ever heard him say it, I marched us to the Federal Reserve. That's how he and I connected, because we understand the political and and the the policy implications of of the uniparty, of the globalist agenda, of the Fed, of Wall Street, of D.C., of Hollywood, of Silicon Valley. We understand this. He has already come out and said, Royce White is the future of the Republican Party. And let me tell these, these people who are watching something about real Nazi white nationalism. They don't make no exceptions for black people based on shared ideas. There is no Nazi exception of black people or Jewish people based on shared beliefs. That's not a real thing. They have tried to caricature Steve Bannon as a white supremacist because he came from Wall Street and he knows the truth the same way I do because I came from behind the curtain. I know how the NBA thinks. I know how the Fifth Avenue crew thinks about humanity, about business, about the the, the, about our country, about freedom, 
about free speech. We know how these people think and all they can do to hold off the, the real genuine revolution where the American people and people all over the world wake up and kick these people out of power is paint the truth tellers as crazy white nationalists. And that's what they want to say. I think this Washington Post piece is going to work for you the same way as the Washington Post hit piece on libs of TikTok worked. Uh, they tried that last week, and libs of TikTok has only become more powerful and popular since then. And so I see this story when I, when I when you sent it to me this morning, I was like, oh my god. They think this dude could pose a problem for Ilhan Omar and perhaps even the, you know, in this race you're running right now, but they see him as an even bigger threat down the road. I think this piece acknowledges that you're in a threat to the establishment, Elon Omar, the democratic narrative, the whole nine yards. I, I, I think this story is really a hat tip to you. No, it absolutely is. I'm not upset with the, 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 old, the implications of the piece personally, right? I mean, besides them saying I'm a white nationalist, I thought the piece was great, to be honest. Again, like the Guardian piece that, that they did a month back, as far as hit pieces go, this is fantastic, okay? They, they sang my praises and tried to, uh, you know, assassinate my character all at once. That never works. Because when you look through my body of work, the things I've said and the things I've stood for speak for themselves. It, it, they all speak for themselves. Nothing I'm doing is a grift or, or a, an attempt to try and manipulate an audience to make money. If I wanted to just make money, I would have kept my mouth shut and st still been in the NBA today where they've inflated the salary price, this, the salaries. OK, what I am upset about and what does frustrate me is that I know people in the community I came from, read these headlines and they take them to heart. They are easily, they are easily convinced by the power and momentum and influence of mainstream media. And the people who spoke under anonymity in this article prove that. They have no clue who Steve Bannon is. They've never actually listened to him talk. They get their politics with French fries. And as I said before, if we're going to get our politics with French fries in this country, which is our choice, it's not mine, it's our choice as a nation. If we're going to do that, the premium on leadership grows exponentially. That's why I'm running and that's why they're afraid because most of our leaders, our political leaders on both sides of the aisle, they're all in on it. Let me show you how they're in on it, Jason. Let's go with the Republicans, since I'm this far right darling and, and, and you know, I'm just trying to run a grift. Let me show you how this Republican fundraising thing goes. They have these third party middlemen fundraisers who have access to these lists of Republican donors across the country. And they come to you and say, we'll do a deal risk free where we connect you via mail or, or, or email to these Republican donors. Risk free. The deal is the split is 85-15. 85-15 in the direction of the third party fundraiser. This is common practice. So for years, for generations, the way fundraising has gone in the Republican party, and I would assume similar in the Democrat party, is that there are third party people on the, on the periphery of campaigns taking 85 cents on the dollar from the Americans who want to give money to impact campaigns. That's a double cross and a triple cross from the establishment to milk the pennies and shekels off of what already is an industry that has billions and trillions of dollars of economic implication. These are the things that they're afraid that I'll talk about. I'm not in the NBA today because they're afraid of what I'll say. They're afraid that I'll get up on the podium and say the CCP has control of this league and they do. So we have to ask ourselves as citizens, do we really value our citizenship? Do we really value America? Do we value our lives? Because we are completely indoctrinated 
and, and dead set on a zealot like a zealot like capitulation and participation as as viewers with with in, with institutions, sports institutions who have sold us out. And when the one young man like me speaks up, everybody gets off. Everybody gets their catharsis by saying, Royce, you just weren't good enough to play. That's why they wanted you out. You just weren't good enough. Who would believe that? Somebody who needs the establishment to give them the validation to continue to follow. We're in a dogfight now for the truth. You, me, the rest of the fearless army, the fearless audience, every single man, woman, and child from here to Beijing is in a dogfight for the future. Royce, I got to take care of a little business. Sit tight. I want to talk a little bit about preborn. When we come back, I'm going to let TJ Moe into the conversation and ask Royce a couple of questions. Uh, TJ was fascinated by the article. He's been sitting here with me listening to Royce. But uh, first, let me tell you about the Ministry of Preborn and Blaze Media are partnering to help rescue 50,000 babies from abortion in 2022. Preborn is the direct competition to Planned Parenthood and the largest provider of free ultrasounds in the United States. When you let a woman see her baby on ultrasound and hear the heartbeat, she is 80% more likely to choose life for her baby. And when the mother chooses life, preborn doesn't stop there. Preborn provides maternity and baby clothes, diapers, car seats, counseling, and much more free of charge. Free of charge. They just don't talk the woman into having a baby. They then provide the help she needs to properly develop. They help walk her through the process, build that bond with the child, provide the support, the confidence, everything a mother needs to support that baby. That's why preborn is so important. Preborn has a passion to save unborn babies from abortion and see women come to Christ. Over the past 15 years, preborn centers have saved 188,000 babies. Will you help rescue babies' lives? To donate, dial pound 250 and say keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash fearless. I keep telling you guys, if you want to be a fearless soldier and, and you're sitting around thinking, how can I do it? How can I do it? I keep telling you, these sponsors of ours, and they're out doing God's work. We got to support them. Nothing better you could do as a fearless soldier, nothing better you could do as someone that wants to support American values and a Christian worldview than support preborn. Preborn.com slash fearless or pound 250 keyword baby. Let's get to work, fearless army. All right, let's circle back. We're not, we're not slowing down. We're not stopping. Let's circle back to uh, Royce White. Royce. Uh, TJ, I want to bring you into this kind. You've been listening to uh, Royce and I for 30 minutes. I know you read the story. Mm -hmm. Did you have any questions or thoughts or, uh, you know, ideas you wanted to share here, push to Royce? Yes. One, one question specifically, and it was a small, one tiny sentence in the article that was just a giant hit piece. But my, because Royce is such an outspoken Christian, Obviously on this show, I've, I've seen him do it elsewhere. I'm curious if it, it seems to me the Washington Post and the left is trying to cast Christianity as a conspiracy theory. And I say that because this is the sentence in the story. He's embraced conspiracy theories ranging from origins of the coronavirus to the integrity of the 2020 presidential election. And then here it comes at the end, the satanic influences in the federal government. Anybody in the federal government, all of them right now, who are pushing abortion, that is definitionally satanic. The trans movement is satanic. These are, these are obvious Christian principles. Royce is out there saying it. And so I am wondering if part of the attack on Royce, and, and he's had obviously more discussions with the people uh, attacking me, sat down with the guy for three hours in the Washington Post. Royce, do you think that a big part of this is because you are such an outspoken Christian, they are now trying to cast, along with painting you as a white nationalist, they're trying to cast Christianity as a whole as a conspiracy theory. 
Well, th that's a brilliant pickup, TJ. I mean, it, it, it it's not even hidden. They're trying to say that Christianity is white nationalism, and that is their story. This entire movement, this entire ne neoliberal movement is to reject God and to say, if you believe in God, you're crazy, right? I mean, that's that's really the, the motif they're trying to draw down from this article. Royce White, he had these issues with mental health. That's why he's not in the league. He, he had to go to the ER for a panic attack. So there's already already question about his psychological stability. And oh, by the way, he believes Satan is at work in the world. Royce, it, it goes to a topic that I'm going to get into on tomorrow's show with Delano, but I, I might as well get into it with you and, and TJ a little bit here. They had a story the day before from Jennifer Rubin in the Washington Post that basically, well, I don't, I don't have to basically, I'm going to call it up here. Uh, the GOP is no longer a party. It's a movement to impose white Christian nationalism. And so basically they're describing Christianity as white supremacy. It's messaging to black people. If you're a Christian, you know you're really supporting white racism. And this is what has so offended me. And when you talked earlier about why I had to get to a place of independence where I could talk about what's really going on and what's really on the table. This is at the heart of it. Christianity is being completely distorted, mischaracterized. You want to talk about a disinformation campaign, the one being done on Christianity and the one particularly being done to black people as it relates to Christianity. Christianity walked us up out of slavery, walked us up into equality, those principles, those leaders. And the Washington Post is basically trying to convince black, <laughs> no, Christianity is actually why you were a slave and it's why uh, you can't uh, have same-sex marriage. Christianity is the worst thing on the planet. And that, that's, that's why I'm here and not somewhere on ESPN or Fox Sports. Uh, and again, that's not even a shot at Fox Sports or ESPN, but that's not what they do. They don't talk about the real stuff. And I needed to be talking about the real stuff because we're in a time right now that is so satanic, I don't respect the people that aren't addressing these issues. Uh, but th the framing of Christianity as white nationalism and then to turn around the next day and say that Royce White is a white nationalist and basically it's because he has Christian values, it's offensive to me. It's offensive to me as well. And here's the telltale sign. Go back and pull up the article from closer to George Floyd's, the George Floyd uprising from the Washington Post where they propped me up as a, as a rising civil rights activist. Nothing I said during that time has changed regarding my platform and what I'm speaking out against, other than the fact that Christianity has now been a focal point. The only, when I was talking about corporatocracy, the Fed, uh, uh, economic tyranny, um, you know, uh, individual rights, the Constitution, the liberals didn't even have a problem with that. Now, they weren't going to give me a, a, a special spotlight to really espouse the, the details and nuances of my protest in, in Minneapolis, but they certainly weren't trying to hang me or, or rake me over the coals for saying those things. The only thing that has changed between now and then is that I have been more outspoken and focused on the, the implications in the spiritual. And you can pull the articles right up and put them next to each other. When the Christianity wasn't a part of it, it wasn't a central focus, uh, they were saying that I was the next rising civil rights leader. They were propping me up. They were singing my praises. And the only difference in what they're explaining about me now is that he's a Christian and Christianity is white nationalism by default. So you've taken me to a spot that I wanted to zero in on because th they cleverly in this article took a quote from you when you were on MSNBC with Joy Reid during the George Floyd thing. Mm -hmm. And they kind of used to say, clearly he's pivoted. 
And so let me read this. He was featured in outlets from MSNBC to the Washington Post with a message that sounded similar to others in the Black Lives Matter movement. Quote from Royce White, we're talking about pushing the police all the way outside of the circle of trust and having them reestablish their entry into the circle of trust through their actions and through proving that they can be trusted in that circle, he told MSNBC host Joy Reid. They're, they're, basically, they're arguing, it was like, Royce White wanted to defund the police, and now he's talking to Steve Bannon. No, I actually never wanted to defund the police. I said we need to refund and overhaul police resources, particularly because police are, by and large, undertrained, and the trauma they face out there on the job leaves them in a very, very vulnerable position when they come back to the job, day in and day out. Nobody could deny that. And, and in fact, the police and the lack of funding or training or attention that's paid to police departments at the federal level isn't by accident. It's the lowest rung of the military industrial complex that is used as an offshoot and safeguard from the pe for the people to rebel and revolt against the state for economic imperialism. I don't know if that goes over people's heads. Basically, the police are there to patrol the interest of the corrupt. They would never let me say that. They would never give me the time. They wanted to give me three minutes. And in what I said there, we do have to always be mindful of the authority we give the government and police. Because when the vaccines are mandated in the future, which they will be, it'll come back. Make no mistake about it, COVID's coming back around. You see it now. It's not gonna be the white coats going door to door to force you to get vaccinated. It'll be the police. And in any country throughout history, when the state goes tyrannical, the police carry marching orders. And if the police at that time throw down their badges and say, this is unconstitutional, they will find more people to put the badges on. And my right wing fellow Americans have lost sight of the skepticism we should rightfully have about police because the boomerang of the left using them as a scapegoat for their race misinformation. We can't be that gullible. We have to be able to sift through both with great precision and pin down on what the enemy is trying to do. No, we shouldn't say that all police are bad or racist or that every time you leave the house as a black man, you're in danger to be shot and killed. But we also shouldn't have this cuck like, uh, uh, you know, support of all police and policing. It's ridiculous. So 45, 46 minutes in, I, I go back to where I started at the beginning just as a journalist and someone that's written stories or whatever and, and very skeptical of modern media, there's a tag, this story was already written before you sat down with David Gardner. Uh, and so the three hour interview is really just like, he's, hey, I'm gonna give you these three hours and hopefully you'll say something to hang yourself in these three hours and I can add a paragraph to this story that's already written because again they've taken everything out of, out of your and so th that's why I'm very reluctant to even consent to any of these interviews and and I've I, I remember when I was at ESPN the one of the ways I, I uh, shook a reporter was like oh yeah I'm gonna tape record this interview I want my own transcript of this interview and 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 so what the reporter he did the interview went on for a couple of hours but uh, just like what they just did with you, didn't use a word of it. Just totally scrapped it and went with the stuff he had previously. And I, I, anyway, he just removed everything from reality. And so I, I'm gonna ask again, do you it ain't all in any way regret doing the interview? Because, and this is, this is where I was really going, Royce, is that when, when you reached out to me one of the things that you were thankful of is like, hey man, I just appreciate you giving me a platform because most people don't have the opportunity to have a hit piece done on them. And then, you know what, I'm gonna give you an hour to dissect and explain why this hit piece is inaccurate. And, and so I love you being here. I love you being smart enough to realize, hey, let me reach out to Whitlock connect with him so I have a platform to respond to, to a lot of this garbage. But 
the, what I just want people, and I think people already know how bogus the mainstream media, media is, but I love when we can give them an example in real time of like, this is what they do. They interviewed this man for three hours. They, they used maybe one sentence from that three hour interview and then built a story around it with the, the stuff they wanted to do. It's, it's a joke to me. This, this is a referendum on how the American people get their information. And I know, I know it's so easy. It's become so easy and, and so, so necessary, you could say, in some cases, to get your information on the fly because of the pace of our society. But we have reached a critical point where the information or misinformation we are given is directly linked to our giving up our freedom going forward. And I do appreciate you. And I've watched and, I, and I've watched you over the years. And, and I like that you're willing to go against the establishment narrative and status quo. That takes real courage. That means you're not a sellout. And what I said about Reggie Miller and all these other journalists or media institutions, even as a whole, that have sold us out. That's not a final position. In Christianity, we don't believe that people's position are final, especially not something like that. There is a potential for all of these people to come back into truth and faith and light and stand up for what is right. And you've done that, I've done that. There's an opportunity for other people to do that. I appreciate the fearless audience, the, 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 the fearless team. I appreciate Blaze Media and, and, and Beck and everything that all these independent alternative media sources are trying to do because the NBA wanted me to kill myself. That's what they're saying in that article. Most people won't read it and see it, but that's what they're really saying. They're tying the final knot for the NBA to say, we're going to try and disconnect you. We're going to make you feel skeptical of all the people closest to you, your family members, your coaches, other people who are around you, who are going to speak under anonymity. Now you don't know who to trust. We're going to further isolate you. We isolated you from the NBA players and the basketball community and all of the people in the black community that are tied to the growth and development of a young basketball player or athlete in our country. We're already going to isolate you from them. Now we want to dig the knife in a little deeper and isolate you from these new political, these new political ambitions and the people so supporting you around that. Could be Jason Whitlock, could be TJ Moe, could be your high school coach, could be your mom, could be your wife. You don't know. What the NBA was saying was, you're right, young man, you're right about truth, you're right about media, you're right about the corporatocracy, you're right about globalism, you're right about Satan, but you don't have enough power to do anything about it. And instead of us actually confronting the lies and doing what's right, we'd rather you kill yourself. They want every American, God-loving, freedom-allegiant person in this country and around the world to kill themselves. You know why? Because they're nihilists. There's nothing better for Satan than to get a person to kill themselves. In World War II, the height of, the height of carnage was people killing each other. After that, they pivoted. I don't pivot. I, I never pivot, especially not for no neoliberal establishment, no white liberal woman. We don't pivot. Strong black men, we don't pivot. They pivoted. When World War II hit, they were, they were satisfied. They were satisfied with the carnage of man killing man. And after World War II, the new scam is to create so much chaos, so much demoralization, so much dependence on drugs and alcohol, so much dependence on porn and superficial affirmation that more people than ever kill themselves. Because that'll really make God sad. I, I don't think he's exaggerating at all about, because uh, again, when he says that, people, man, this dude's off on a conspiracy theory. But I'm sitting here as a journalist, having read this story, and, and then the, the ending kick to the balls that they have here at the end, their intent is to harm Royce White, not just his public in, image, but they want to harm Royce White. Eliminate any threat, right? Uh, that was a brilliant point. One I had not thought of, particularly in his situation with somebody who's dealt with a lot of anxiety. That's exactly what they're trying to do. And we have moved from a position where you actually go kill people. And as he's talked about, allow people 
to go kill themselves. Whether that's with dif disinformation, whether that's with getting everybody to think they're crazy and, and abandoning them. There's one sentence in here, another one that bothered me, there were several. It says, in these far-right far right figures, White seemed to find what, he's, what he was looking for all those years when he entered the NBA, acceptance and an audience. In turn, he helps to diversify and mainstream a movement often associated with white nationalism. First of all, I thought diversity was a good thing. Turns out now it's a bad thing. So that's, that's good. The second thing is, is <clears throat> even his own family member that was willing to contribute to a hit piece on Royce came out and said, I know he's really smart. So if you have a really smart black man joining what you view as a white nationalist movement, shouldn't you take a second look and think maybe you're the one that's wrong? Instead, they turn around and say, he's crazy. He probably hates himself. By the way, he's got anxiety. By the way, your family shouldn't trust you. This guy won't be around much longer anyway. Don't pay him any attention. I, I that is an excellent uh, summary. Uh, Royce, the, the only thing I will add about this family member quote, having dealt with dishonest media and having been an honest journalist, who knows how this alleged family member actually unpacked what he was saying. There's an ellipsis in here where that's an indication that words are missing and you, you have no idea what the person said before, after, you know, they could have had a three hour conversation and they cherry picked this one little quote, uh, the, the, what they hope is the kill shot, uh, which again, just hammers the point to me that wow, you pose a threat to them. Cause this is one of the most vicious articles I, I, I've seen, but do you have any idea if they did talk to a family member or is it, I don't know, what was your reaction to the way they ended the story? Look, I know they talked to a lot of people. I had people who I haven't talked to in about 10 years message me on social media and say, hey, do you know why the Washington Post is reaching out to me asking, you know, asking about you or, you know, they're trying to do an article on me. Should I talk to them? And I told everybody who asked me who they reached out to, talk to them. Because God's going to judge. The truth is the truth. If you're not in a, if you know me, if you're around me, if you're close to me, if you're related to me, if we have a relationship and on your journey, you haven't come to know the truth and see the game and lies, that's for you to deal with personally and with God. This train is rolling. And I told the Washington Post today on Twitter, we are leaving the Democrat plantation and there's nothing they can do about it. They can write as many hit pieces as they want, but they're doing it from an ivory tower, a white liberal ivory tower. And the people who know me, who I touch, the young men who I coach at the high school level, at the grade school level, the young people I've gone and spoken to about mental health at the high school, at the elementary school, at the church, in corporations, they know who I am. They know what I'm saying. And eventually, when the noise is sorted through, David Gardner has to face God and he probably doesn't believe in God. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a long, long day in hell for him when that time comes. So even I'm not even upset at the person in my family who may have said that they may not have said it, but even if they did, I'm not upset with that. What, what, of, on what, what effect does that have on what I'm doing? Nothing. My grandmother, my grandmother, one of my grandmothers was a lifelong Democrat. When I wrote my open letter to Steve Bannon, to the to the Congress and, and talked about the kangaroo courts, she called me and said, I'm actually convinced. I'm convinced now because of the way you wrote that out. See, the, the reason why I'm a really a threat, even more so than other black Republicans who may be leaving the plantation, the reason why I'm really a threat is because I take myself seriously enough to think about these issues long enough to write a 3,500 word response to the to the Washington Post. And it'll be up tomorrow. It will be up tomorrow morning. From right now today to eight o'clock in the morning, there will be a 3,500 word response to the Washington Post defamation of character and hit piece. That's why they fear me. And they know I write better than David Gardner. And they don't want anybody to read what I write. It's the same thing they did to Malcolm. It's the same thing they do to all, when I say strong black men, I mean black men who won't bend. You could be Christian, you could be Muslim. I know black Jews. 
Uh, you know, you could be you, you, you. I know people who don't necessarily believe in God that don't bend. But I know by and large, there's a lot of black folks and a lot of black men who have bent, who have sold out. And I represent a change, a sea change. There's nothing they could offer me that would that would get me to sell out the American people, humanity, freedom. There's nothing they could offer. Imagine that if you're watching this right now. Imagine a number in your head that you would accept to bend on the morals and ethics. And when you see my face, understand there's no amount of money that these people could offer me. And when people make stands like that and they make it clear there's no money that can that can that can buy their allegiance, they kill them. And that's why I got this vest on that says enemy. I, I'm going to be transparent here and because I, I was literally thinking about making this point and saying, nah, I won't be understood and it's the wrong analogy or, or whatever, but it, it, I don't want to divert in any way, do anything, that, but I just got to say it because it's real and this show is about being real and transparent. Years ago when I was in college at Ball State, I used to listen to a lot of Louis Farrakhan tapes, Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan. You know, the Nation of Islam has a lot of beliefs that I disagree with, but the masculinity and the responsibility that Farrakhan used to call for, for black men to have, I'm sorry, it attracted me. I'm, I'm never gonna apologize for that. And he once told a story about people throwing rocks at you. And uh, if, if you attract enough critics, they'll throw so many rocks at you that they'll pile, the rocks will pile up and you just climb on top of the rocks and you're taller and you're louder and your voice is more heard. And that's what I see going on with you. You keep attracting these rock throwers and you just keep getting taller and louder and a bigger force. And that's where I see things going for you, Royce. And, and, you're built for it. Not just the, the backbone strength, but the intellect to be able to handle these conversations and handle yourself, explain your positions. And th that's what always would crack me up when we celebrate uh, Colin Kaepernick or LeBron James. And I'm like, these dudes are mental midgets. They, any, any resistance and they fall completely down. They won't even expose themselves to resistance. You know, only Don Lemon uh, can interview LeBron James or, or you know, some, somebody that's gonna worship him and tickle his little boys. Uh, that's the only people that can interview a LeBron James, whereas Royce White will step into the ring with anybody. If, if Anderson Cooper, Rachel Maddow, anybody from the LGBT movement or whatever wants to interview Royce, no problem. Let, let's go. If, if Barack Obama wants to question Royce White, let's go. Uh, <laughs> these guys, paper tigers and cowards. Royce, I, I, I appreciate the time. TJ, I, did you have a final question or thought you wanted to jump in? Before? I think we're going to, yeah, we're going to let this go, Royce, for now. Uh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to circle back because, again, there will be more rocks thrown probably before the week is out. Uh, and certainly before the weekend's over, and we'll circle back. Uh, thank you for making the time. Uh, great job. I think I hear tomorrow playing. Uh, that means we'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all receiving We all wanna be free We want freedom